Next up is Mr. Thomas Beller, author and contributor to the New Yorker magazine and the New York Times. Julie's word, uh, clamor, the, ins the problem when you take your eye off the ball and, and, you're, and you're not clamoring enough. And she was talking in terms of, you know, brass tax, federal funding, dollars. But it's an evocative word in other ways. Um, my background as a professional person and a creative person has nothing to do with lead, or I should say didn't. Uh, it didn't particularly focus on public health or health at all. I'm a complete Martian interloper, <laughs> novice. That said, um, clamor is closer to my, I wouldn't say specialty, let's call it an interest, you know, as a writer. So one of the things I was thinking about coming down here is who the most effective advocates for changing policy and funding at the federal level, state level, who are the most effective voices? I don't mean in fact, practically speaking. I just mean potentially. And my feeling is that the most effective voices could be the parents yep. of little children who've been poisoned. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, that includes, when I say poison, I'm speaking from the point of view of our current understanding. You know, I loved uh, Brenda's remark uh, we have the knowledge, we have the information. She sounded like a kind of female Latin intro to the $6 million man. <laughs> we have the technology, we can rebuild it. But rebuilding, you know, it's an evocative phrase as well. In New Orleans, she used the word rebuild, but clamor. So the parents of kids who've been poisoned, and I use that word to incorporate the old sense of poison, the convulsing, the physical symptoms showing up in little kids that um, doctors were seeing in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and now this second sense of poison, which is different. Uh, as Brenda herself also said during the previous talk, this is a, uh, uh, the people in this room are working against their own past success. Well, we got it below 40. You don't see kids vomiting and convulsing and showing immediate observable symptoms from lead poisoning, but as we know, there's very insidious and extreme and even measurable in dollars type of problems that occur at much lower levels. So parents of little kids, infants, toddlers, who've been poisoned, they should be and could be the most powerful advocates for change at the level that Julie is talking about, but they're not. And my contribution, I feel, could be to think about why that is. And my data, shall we say, comes entirely from myself because I fall into that category. That was why I became interested in this. I had, I'll call it a skirmish with my first kid, who's now eight, when I was living in New York City. But the things really got hot, shall we say, here in New Orleans because of two things. One is the skirmish alerted me in the most general sense to the issues and the dangers of lead poisoning. The other is, in this town, there's a very strange paradox. Of all the cultural baubles that it advertises and that it's you know, justifiably proud of, music, food, and so forth, probably architecture and just the built environment of New Orleans has got to be, if not number one, at the very top of the list. This is not some small old town <coughs> that you can walk in 90 minutes. The fabric of the city is this incredible, sprawling thing with these evolving architectural styles that are, you know, subjectively, I would say, quite beautiful and, and objectively, definitely very unique. The paradox is that these old buildings are very old buildings. And they're inside and out, often have layers and layers of paint from before the lead band. Yeah. And this is a fact that exists in areas that are poor and areas that are rich. New Orleans is quite unique, I think, in that way, in which there's not this dichotomy. The richest people in this town are living in houses filled with lead. Howard Milkey, who's been a sort of ambassador of this topic, is present right now, did a remediation at a playground. It took a lot of work to get it done. 
you know, it's the probably the highest per capita playground, you know, the Neal Street playground. This is an issue, it's just it's laid bare what's true nationally or internationally, it's just laid bare very crisply and cleanly in New Orleans that this is an issue that touches every child and therefore every parent. So why aren't parents better advocates, better at clamoring? I posed that question to myself and I got an answer in the form of a passage that was in a book by named William Bowman. He's traveling in Alaska. The mosquitoes are really bad. There's a hitchhiker on the side of the road dancing, it looks like. The woman is dancing on the road. And he drives by this crazy kind of dancing figure in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. And only a few seconds later it occurs to him that she's outside and is being bitten to death by these mosquitoes. But he, that's not immediately visible, you just see the gestures. And to me that was a very evocative image because if I think about how I felt in the first days after I got a blood level test for my younger kid, it, it echoes that gesture that that woman dancing frantically, of course dancing is not what she was doing, she was frantically trying to swap away mosquitoes and was being bitten and in pain. It was a terrible experience, but it looked like kind of this funny, strange thing. You, you couldn't see what was afflicting her. And of course there's some metaphorical resonance with the situation with lead and lead dust. Since the, the culprits are basically invisible. And then we have the added problem Unlike a mosquito bite, small as that is, we have the added problem of the harm is also invisible. At least it remains invisible for quite some time. So that when it manifests itself, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to point to the result of the problem, you know, what the crime wrought, shall we say, and then trace it all the way back to something that happened two, three, four, five, six years earlier. So I'm making a list in my mind, why can't the parents who've been afflicted with this terrible thing be more clamorous in the sense that Julie means and Brenda? Well, one thing is they're very upset. And another thing is they have, how should I put this in a semi-polite way, they've messed up. They screwed up in the most important job they have, right? So, there's a lot of complication around that feeling. It doesn't matter if it's not your fault at all. If your little kid, your baby, has been hurt neurologically, you screwed up, you let that happen. At one point the secretary was talking about um, educating kids and kids being an agent for change. And I do recognize that there's a logic to that, but you know, I'm thinking about infants and toddlers. You know, they're a bad political constituency. They, they really have no voice in the political process. I mean, that's funny, but let's just meditate on that fact. The actual victim has absolutely no voice, so it's left to the parents. The parents, meanwhile, are totally on the hook. I mean, I'm gonna go way outside of the bounds of coherence at this moment, but just yesterday, uh, the governor of this state delivered a big lecture on the culpability of the father of the Oregon shooter. The guy who shot all those people the other day, it's the father's fault because he was a bad dad. That's kind of disgusting, but in a way it manifests a process that every parent has to go through if their kid is lead poisoned. It's their fault. So if you're going to be clamorous, the first thing you're going to be saying is, I screwed up. You need to somehow integrate that concept. Then it gets a little more complicated because maybe it's the parent's fault in being, not using best practices, but it's a paint job on their house, they sand the house. These houses have been built and have been painted for decades and decades and decades before the invention of the electric sander. Now, it's uh, understood to be the proper way to sand your house. Well, it's against the law to do that if you don't do this properly, but as it's under widely acknowledged, uh, this is not a town that's not big on enforcing laws. And frankly, and I say this in, a, in, a, in, a, in an affectionate way, it's not that big on observing laws. That's part of the charm, you know, long time to lay. So they don't get observed. And the contractors who, in theory, are under threat of enormous fine, uh, 
don't observe it. So the, the enforcement is directed at contractors who have minimal incentive to do anything about it. And my feeling is the homeowners need to be incentivized to do something about it. And the way I decided to pursue this was to sue the neighbor that sanded their house. Not expecting some enormous settlement that is a kind of actual <coughs> performance art, if I may, in, in anticipation of the next speaker. Just to see what happens. What, let's churn the water and see what the issues are, what comes to the surface. Now, at one point, the lawyer who did take on the case said to me, you know, we don't want to go to jury because uh, you're going to start talking about IQ points. And I don't know what a jury's going to make of an IQ point in terms of its value. You know what's an IQ point? It's kind of abstract. And I said, and what I, was, I continue to feel was a rather clever rhetorical flourish, of no value in the courtroom. By the way, that's why I'm not a lawyer. But I said to this guy, I said, well, why don't you just propose that the guy who's arguing against your case, our case, let's say that person has a kid, the opposing lawyer has a kid, and you have a little pill, and it's going to just take away just one IQ point from their little kid. So you're going to give their little kid a little pill, but just, just one IQ point, how much are they going to pay you not to give the kid that pill? What's it worth to the opposing lawyer? What's it worth to the judge? Just one IQ point. And then say, oh, well, 5,000. Depends how much money they have. 10,000. But what about a second pill? Now we're up to two. What about a third pill? I'm very excited about this notion, by the way, because I feel it calls out some hypocrisy. The guy looked at me, you know. Thank you, Tom. Let's move on now. This is not <laughs> So I want to return to this idea of how do you, um, how can the most powerful clamorers be activated? And to understand that, I have to understand what's impeding them. Another thing which Brenda alluded to is the fact that most parents with little kids who are suddenly very interested in the topic that you guys are all involved in, know nothing about it. That's part of why this even happened. In my case, I even knew something about it, and I took a kind of defense approach to someone who was clearly sanding illegally in a way that just had all sorts of debris and dust lying around. It doesn't matter how often you swift her inside. Sooner or later, some little kid, your little toddler, is going to just get it on their hand, hand over it in their mouth. You really need to get it through people's heads in advance that someone sanding the house improperly and it takes a lot to do it properly. There's no ambiguity if they're doing it properly. Someone sending the house improperly may as well come over to your house with a bat, smack your kid on the head. Not kill the kid, just come over, smack the kid on the head, let the kid, maybe there's blood coming down your six-month-old's head, or one-year-old or two-year-old head. Hit him on the head with a hammer, let's say. Yeah. Bang. Okay, concussion, bleeding. That is what is, is happening. You need to respond as though someone is coming towards your child with a hammer. That needs to be your level of response. How can you enable the, this group? I've sort of switched, I just realized. I've switched from the people who are upset because this happened to them to people who should be upset but don't know to be upset. I happen to fall into both groups. Inevitably, those are, those are overlapping groups. The people who have to deal with their kids having elevated levels and now understand a little bit about what's going on. We're previously people who just had the most dim idea. That is bad, but hey, property rights, and she's very nice, and let's not be difficult. No. Parents need to be educated to understand if someone is sanding their house, and the entire topic of lead generally, they are coming to your house with a hammer to smack your kid on the head so they bleed. That is the level of agitation that needs to come from the parent in resistance to this one act. So then how can you take that type of energy and translate it into the clamor? And I don't have an answer for that, but I just wanted to sort of tick off a few boxes about what I was thinking that works against the clamor. The private grief, the self-blame, and one last, oh sorry, I know I'm way over, but I'll just do this quickly. There's two more things I want to mention that work against the, this advocacy group. One is, parents of little kids, infants, don't stay parents of little kids and infants. The kids grow up. And for complicated biological reasons, they actually completely forget what it was like to be the parent of an infant, which is why they go ahead and have another one. <laughs> <laughs> so
So what is very important to the parent of a six-month-old, constituency of that group, the parents of six months old, is in constant flux. People are aging out of that constituency very quickly. And maybe they have another kid, so now they're back in it. But that is a bit of a problem too, and it, this forgetfulness dovetails to another matter, which is, as we all know, a kid who's been poisoned, who's been smacked on the head with a hammer so hard they have a concussion and are bleeding profusely. I think that's my calculation, very unscientific, but what does it mean to have a low level of blood? I'm not talking about a 40, I'm talking 20, 15, 10, 5. What's that? Well, he's going to live, he's going to thrive perhaps. But it's a smack on the head with a hammer, blood coming down the face. A little tiny infant, toddler. Well, um, the kid's going to heal. The scar, maybe a little scar, but the blood will go away. And six months later, they're running around and look fine. And you can't be sitting there going, I let my kid get hit with a hammer. You can't live your life that way. Oh, God, that, that's the one with the got hit with the hammer. These are my three kids. He's great, he's great. He once got hit with a hammer. We have to pity him, keep an eye on him. You cannot live that way. You just have to say, I love this kid. He's going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. We're going to do our best. And in making that statement to yourself, you deprive, you've just taken yourself out of the clamor game. To clamor is to work exactly against the impulse to say, I love this kid, it's fine. I don't care if he's injured, she's injured. We're going to work this out. It's going to be okay. Let's make this work. You need to have that energy as a parent. And if you're clamoring, you're working directly against the cause that everything is okay. Who wants to walk around going, this is a beautiful kid. This, is, this kid was injured. He's the special sad one. No one is going to approach their child or their children in that way. No one wants to advertise a deficit. You want to say, my kid is great. You don't want to say, my kid was hurt and might actually be less smart or less able to learn or have other problems. Please pity me and him. No, that is not the, that is not the thing. So this is really tricky because there's this very powerful series of motives to make parents of kids who've been poisoned just move on. And yet that is the constituency that I'm sure is not just the most potent, but the most untapped. So this is where my thoughts are, and I wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Before we move on to Mr. Mel Chen, Everyone in this room, if I can impose, when you go back, talk to your legislatures, your aldermen, your council members, your elected politicians. Push for universal screening of all children for lead poisoning. Whenever I look at the rates, and they're, they are abysmal, push for it. Uh, across this country, as you probably know, it's explained as well. There are some laws, some aren't being enforced, but the laws really don't cover everything that there's needs. And this is a very simple thing. All providers should screen universal all children for lead poisoning. If that was done 27 years ago, my child, who's now 29, would have been identified a lot sooner than when he was identified with lead poisoning. And I run a lead poisoning prevention program within the city of New Haven, Connecticut. It took me that long to get my own pediatrician to test my own child. I won't go into details. Next up, Mr. Mel Chen.